Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello learners, today we will discuss various evidences of evolution from the paper Evolutionary Biology. Under this module, this is the first lecture where we will discuss various examples coming from different branches of biology that present a supporting evidence for evolutionary approach, which is in contrast to the creationism. I am Dr. Sudhir Verma. Working as Assistant Professor in Department of Zoology, Deen Dayal Upadhyay College, University of Delhi. Under this lecture, we will learn the examples from different biological domains that present an evidence for evolution. These examples are from the morphology or anatomy, from embryology, paleontology, the biogeography, taxonomy, cytology, molecular biology and lastly the physiology and biochemistry. We will go one by one and discuss the some of the prominent examples. Remember this is not a complete list of evidences. There might be many other examples from different resources that you can go through but we will discuss the prominent ones here. So starting with the first one which is morphological and anatomical evidences. Under this, we will discuss the homology of structures or the homologous structures which represent divergent evolution. We will proceed to analogous structures which represent convergent evolution and then we will go to parallel structure which represent the phenomena of parallelism. Then the vestigial organs or vestigiality followed by atavism. Now all these, how they represent evolution, how they prove the theory of evolution, we will discuss side by side. So starting with the homologous organs, the term which was introduced by Richard Owen in 1843. The term homology has been derived from the Greek words homo which means same and logos means relation. Now what are these homologous structures or organs? They are the structures which have a common origin or common ancestry. They have the same fundamental pattern or structures. Though minor structural differences can be there, but the basic pattern and the origin is same. They belong to different groups of species or organisms, but they have different functions. So any two structures which might appear similar, they do have common origin but they are performing different functions. They are called as homologous organs or structures. It's more clear from here. Let's say if you have a species 1 organism and an organism belonging to species 2 which have a similar phenotype that is phenotype A. Probability is that they do have a common ancestor. So these two species bearing the same phenotype is because of the common ancestry for the same genotype but they do perform different functions and hence if you see from the common ancestral point of view they diverged to different species through the process of evolution and hence they are called as divergent evolution. Let us try to understand it with the example and the example here shown is of limb structure particularly the four limb structure of different vertebrates as you can see here ranging from human to lizard, cat, whale, bat, frog and bird. The basic structure if you see they all have a humerus here and then they do have radius and ulna here followed by the carpals. Except a minor difference 
rest all have the same basic pattern or structures as you can notice here. But function wise they do differ in different organisms or different vertebrate classes. So if you see from evolutionary point of view they do indicate that all these organs they do have a common ancestry. So the organisms possessing them they might have originated from a common ancestor which support the evolution. Yet another example is coming from the mouth parts of various insects. Here A represents a primitive type of mouth parts which is of chewing type present in different insects like grasshoppers. It evolved to different mouth parts which we see in different insects nowadays. This might be the lapping type in case of bees. These might be the siphoning type in case of butterflies or it can be the sucking type as present in case of mosquitoes. So they do have different functions in different insects and in different species. But if you see the basic structures or the basic pattern, they all are based on the similar basic structures involving the mandible, maxillae, labium, labrum, hypopharynx, etc. So the basic structure is same but they evolved into different types. So here again the theory of evolution is being supported. Yet another example from the plants we can discuss. The thorns present in bougainvillea. If you compare it with the tendrils which is present in cucurbita. They do might appear similar in structures. They might have different functions though. For example, the thorns in bougainvillea, it is protective in nature, whereas the tendrils in cucurbita is more of a supporting nature. It provides the supports for climbing. They do have a common ancestry. Both of them arise from the axial uh, birds basically. They do have common ancestry. They do appear similar in structures, but they are performing different functions. So again, they indicate towards evolution approach. Now this level of homology which we have discussed through limb structures, insect mouth parts or the plant parts, it's more of phenotypic in nature. But the homology can be seen at various levels. The one which we have discussed is phenotypic in nature and we discussed in different organisms. This homology can also be of genotypic in nature for example at the gene level and the genes which are present in different organisms are called as orthologous genes which we will discuss in a short while. This homology can also be a serial homology which is present in the same organism. For example the vertebrae in mammals if you see they also have the common origin similar structure but functionally they are different. Same is the case with the segments in arthropods. Let us discuss the homology in terms of genes or the genotypic level of homology. The orthologous genes are the genes shared between species because of shared species ancestry. Let us try to understand it with a simple example here. Let's assume there is an ancestral gene X which has undergone a process called gene duplication. So it has made a copy of its own and now the two copies have been named as X.1 and X.2. With the time there is a process of speciation. So this X.1 is present in humans. It has undergone in other species say chimpanzee and same is the case with X.2. So one copy is in the human lineage, another copy is in the chimpanzee lineage. Now if you compare the human X.1 with the chimpanzee X.1, they represent the orthologous genes. So the genes which are present in different species but there is a common ancestry. On the other hand, if you compare the human X.1 with the human X.2 within the same organism but different genes arising because of duplication 
they are termed as paralogous genes. Yet another branch can be if you compare human X.1 with the another organism, let's say are some bacterial genes or pet proteins. They present analogous structures or organs. Here, this is an example of, let's say, globin gene family. So there is an early globin gene which has undergone gene duplication and has formed alpha gene and beta gene. Now this alpha gene after gene duplication has speciated. That means it has undergone in different species, let's say frog, human and mouse. So the same gene which is coming under in different species, it is called as orthologous. Whereas if you compare mouse alpha gene with the beta gene of mouse again, same organism but duplicated genes, this is called as paralogous and all of them together are called as homologous genes. Moving ahead to serial homology, as I just mentioned, this is present in the same organism. There are different names for the serial homology which people have given. For example, the iterative homology, normative homology, serial homology, homonomy, homotypy, paralogy and so on. But the phenomena is almost the same. Here, the comparison is between the characters of the same individual at the same time. So, this is not the comparison in different species or organisms. This is not the comparison at different time points, but the same individual and same time. And here the example we have shown is the, of the vertebrae. So, these vertebrae do appear similar. They might have common origin, but still they perform slightly different functions. But remember, they are present in the same organism. This is something which we call as serial homology. Now, besides this serial homology or the types which we just discussed in terms of level of homology, there might be other terminologies involved to discuss the homology. For example, this particular paper describes the homology types as four different level. We are not going to discuss all these types, but this is just to show you that this homology can be at various levels depending on what is the time point you are discussing, what are the organisms you are discussing and so on. Then there are terms like apomorphy, which means the derived characters that sets the clade apart from other clades. If you focus here, these represent the apomorphy, which means these black ones, they are the derived characters that sets these clades apart from the other clades. For example, if you compare these clades with this one, these clades do have certain characters which they have derived such that they are different from these other clades. This phenomena is called as apomorphy. There is another phenomena which is called as simplicyomorphy, wherein an ancestral trait shared by two or more taxa. So let's say these are two taxon or two taxa and there is an ancestral trait which is coming from let's say from here to here and it is being shared by these two. So this is called as simplicyomorphy. There is another thing which we call as autopomorphy where a distinctive derived trait that is unique to a given taxon or group is present. For example, here, unlike apomorphy, it is not being shared with anyone. This is something which is making this particular clade or taxon unique. Yet another term is called as synapomorphy, which is nothing but a shared apomorphy. So, Unlike apomorphy, here this common ancestor also have this derived characters. So, a derived trait that is shared by two or more taxa of shared ancestry, it is called as synapomorphy. In contrast, there is a phenomena of homoplasy, wherein a trait gained or lost independently in separate lineages during evolution. So, during the course of evolution, there is a particular derived character which has been gained or lost independently. 
in two separate lineages. This is one lineage, this is another lineage. They do have the shared characters, a character, but they both have derived it independently. And this is something which we call as convergent evolution or analogy, which is in contrast to our homology or homologous structures, which we just discussed. So let's try to understand what are these analogous organs. Organs of different animals having different structures but perform the same functions. Just see, it is totally con in contrast to what we discussed about homologous organs. The homologous organs were having similar structural pattern or the common ancestry but performing the different functions. The analogous ones, they do have different structures but perform similar functions. And thus, they represent convergent evolution in contrast to divergent evolution as being shown by homologous organs. Now try to focus here. Now these two organisms of species, let's say species 1 and species 2, they have a same phenotype, let's say phenotype C. But they have originated from different ancestors. The ancestor is not same here. There is no common ancestry. This organism is coming from ancestor with a phenotype A. This organism is coming from an ancestor which is having a phenotype B. So, here two species of same phenotype whose common ancestor is far distant in past is being shown here. Let's try to understand it with different examples. Here, a bird wing has been compared with a wing of an insect. Now, if you see, the structural pattern is totally different. Here, you see the ulna, carpals, radius, humerus, different bones are there. Here, it is simply the forewing and hindwing. So, basic structural pattern is different. But both of them perform the same function, which is just flying. So, these are the analogous organs. Yet another example, as you can see, these two very similar looking forms, body forms of different organisms, let's say euphobia and astrophyton. They do appear similar, but they are having what? Same structure or same function? No, they are having same functions, but their structures are different. So again, these are example of analogous organs. Yet another example we can discuss in terms of streamline appendages in different organisms belonging to different groups or vertebrate classes. Here, a shark has been shown from the fishes, a penguin belonging to the birds, dolphin belonging to the mammals. Sharks do possess fins, penguins do possess wings, dolphins do possess flippers. Structurally, if you see, all three are different, very different. But they perform the similar function. They are streamlined appendages which help in the movement. So they are also the evidence of evolution. Coming forward, let us try to understand what do we mean by the parallel structures or the phenomena of parallelism. Here, the similarity is based on the shared genes or developmental pathways. Similar features arise in related lineages whose common ancestor lacked them. Let's focus on this picture. Similar feature. So species 1 and species 2 have similar feature, let's say phenotype B. Arise in related lineages, these two lineages are related, whose common ancestor, let's say these are the common ancestor, they lack them. They do arise from a common ancestor which is having a phenotype A. So, here two species with same phenotype descended from a common ancestor with a different phenotype and genotype. So, this common ancestor has different genotype and phenotype but these two species which are coming from this common ancestor, they do share the phenotype. Now, remember this is different from the analogy where we discussed that there is no common ancestor. Here, the phenomena of common ancestry is there. It's just that the common ancestor 
did not have the same phenotype or genotype. The example of parallelism can be the patagium. As you can see, this is the patagium which we see here. This is a flying lemure, whereas this is a flying squirrel. But both have this patagium developed. So this is an example of parallel evolution or parallelism. Yet another example we can discuss in the similarity in the phenotypes of three different groups of class Mammalia. That is Prototheria, Eutheria and Metatheria. These are the representative example of three classes. And as you can see the similarity in terms of the claws and in terms of the snouts and the long tongue that they possess. So again this is an example of parallel evolution. Moving ahead let us discuss what we call as vestigial organs. How to define vestigial organ is the phenomena of retention of genetically determined structures or attributes during the process of evolution that have lost some or all of their ancestral function in a given species. In simple words, in a given species, the structures are still retained which used to perform, perform some functions in their ancestral forms but in modern times, in today's time, they do not have any functional role but still the structure is present. These are called as the vestigial organs. For example, the auricular muscles of ear pinna. We do not use it. We do not move our pinna. The vermiform appendix. We do not have any requirement or a function attributed to this structure which is still present in all of us. The tailbone. We do not have tail but still we do have a tailbone present. The nictitating membrane. We do not have a functional role of this membrane in today's lifetime. But still these structures do exist. So what is the point or the relevance of it? They indicate that during the course of evolution they have lost their function but our ancestral forms probably used to have a role associated with them. So again this is also an evidence for the phenomena of evolution. Yet another phenomena is called as atavism. Atavism is reappearance of ancestral traits after having been lost through evolutionary change in previous generations. Means there are some ancestral traits or characters or attributes which used to be there in our ancestral forms but they got lost. And for generations after generations we did not have these kind of characters but suddenly they do reappear in some forms. For example, here you can see the existence of a cervical fistula. Here the example is of supernumerary or additional nipples in case of a man. So these are the characters which do appear, reappear suddenly but they were present in our ancestral forms and for generations there was no existence of it. These also indicates towards evolution and the phenomena here is atavism. So after discussing all these morphological and anatomical evidences, let us try to understand how embryology provides supporting evidence for evolution. Under this embryological evidences, we will discuss the early embryonic or say early development in triploblastic organisms. And when I say triploblastic, that means the animals which do have their organs or tissues developed from three germ layers which we name as ectoderm, mesoderm and endoderm. So basically platyhelminths onwards we are talking about these triploblastic organisms. We will see how their early development prove or provide an evidence of evolution. Then we will discuss the early embryonic development in case of different vertebrate classes. Lastly, we will discuss a theory which is called as recapitulation theory or biogenetic law. How that proves the theory of evolution. 
So, in triploblastic organisms, if you compare their embryonic development, there is a common pattern of development. After fertilization, an egg goes to the next stage which is called as blastula. Blastula goes to gastrula and gastrula then forms the germ layers which further leads to formation of tissues and organ systems. So, this common pattern of development is followed in all the triploblastic organisms irrespective of their complexity, their uh, origin, irrespective of their forms and differences otherwise, which indicates that there has been a common origin. So, that is why they still do share this common pattern of development. Yet another example comes from the similar embryonic development in case of vertebrates. Structures in embryos that have no purpose in adult and are absent, still they are found in our embryonic stages. For example, the gill slits, the tails in let's say a human embryo is still being found, though we do not have any purpose or function of these structures in adult forms. So, the existence of these kind of structures in embryonic forms again indicates towards evolutionary processes that have taken place in our past. The third point we need to discuss in embryological evidence is the von Beer's law or also called as Beer's laws of embryology which has been given by Carl Ernst von Beer who besides this also discovered the notochord, blastula stage and mammalian ovum. So, it had different contributions in the field of embryology or let us say developmental biology. But here we will discuss the points he has given about the von Beer's law. He says that general features common to a large group of animals appear earlier in the embryo then do specialized features. Means the characters or the features which are more general to a large group they do appear first and the specialized features appear later on. Let us say if we are talking about a particular bird a general feature which is common to all vertebrates let us say let us say hurt it arises first and the more specialized feature for a bird let us say a feather it arises much later. So, general features appear first, then the specialized features. The development of a particular embryonic character progresses from general to specialized during the ontogeny. Ontogeny is the self-development, the developmental process of an organism. Each embryo of a given species, instead of passing through an adult stage of other animals, departs more and more from them as ontogeny progresses. So, if you talk about in terms of evolution, each embryo of a given species, instead of passing through the adult stage of the previous lower animals, it departs from this embryonic stages to different groups. Therefore, the earthy embryo of a higher animal is never like the adult of a lower animal. But, their embryos were similar. Now, similar to these points which von Beer has put forward, Ernst Haeckel has given the recapitulation theory or biogenetic law, which says the ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. The ontogeny means the development of one's own, how we have developed individually. The phylogeny is the ancestral development. That means how a particular species has evolved with time. So, this particular statement says that the developmental process of an individual repeats the phylogenetic process that has taken place in the origin of that particular species. Heckel also gave various embryonic drawings. Now, here you can see the fishes belonging to uh, fishes, spices, salamander belonging to amphibians, tortoise belonging to reptiles, 
chick from birds and rabbit from mammal so all vertebrate classes he has taken as example of their embryos to show how they show the similarity in terms of development so this is an ontogenic development of fish this is ontogenic development of salamander but when you compare their embryonic stages it shows how each organism is showing the phenomena of repetition of phylogeny through their ontogenic developments how ernst haeckel and von beer differ in their theories is according to haeckel the developmental stages recapitulate adult evolutionary stage means if you compare the egg embryo and adult of fish frog and bird so this is the egg of fish which undergoes through embryonic stage and forms the adult fish when you compare it with the frog's development the egg is same but there is a stage in frog's embryonic development which resembles the adult fish same is the case with bird there is an egg but during the development of bird there are stages which resemble the adult fish and the adult frog so this is the haeckel's view on its theory about embryological evidence the von beer's theory says there is no recapitulation means the embryo's development is increasingly diverse he says that egg or the early stages is let's say similar but the egg develops to fish here the egg diverses from here so this embryonic development it gets diverse and this diversity keeps on increasing from different species to species so there is no attainment of adult form of a lower animal in the embryonic development of a complex organism or higher animals so what we have discussed cover uh, so far is morphological and anatomical evidences and embryological evidences now let us move on to paleontological evidence or how fossils represent as evidence of evolution